Hello and welcome to AFTD's educational webinar series, A Care Paradigm for Persons with FTD, being presented by Dr. Alvin Holm today. I am Bridget Moran, the Support Services Manager with AFTD, and on behalf of those here at AFTD and Dr. Holm, we are thrilled you're able to join us today. So before we get started, I just want to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's events. Uh, we will be using our time today to create a virtual dialogue with Dr. Holm and really dig into your questions around his idea of a care paradigm. So with so many joining, we do ask that you submit your questions by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel, and we encourage you to send your questions as you think of them. Uh, we'll end each section with opportunities for those questions, uh, so don't wait until the end of the presentation to uh, submit them. And we will have you muted for the duration of the presentation, which means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. And that just really helps keep down on the background noise um, so everyone can hear the presenter clearly. If you are having any technical issues, uh, please write a message in the chat box within the sidebar, and we'll do our best to answer those questions without interrupting our guest. And today's educational webinar is scheduled for an hour and a half. Uh, we are recording this and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel and uh, website in the upcoming days for those who either missed it or want to revisit it. So for those of you who are meeting us for the first time, AFTD is a nonprofit organization whose entire focus is on FTD disorders. Our mission is uh, that we work every day to improve the quality of life of people affected by FTD and drive research for a cure. Uh, we do this through advancing research, awareness, support, education, and advocacy. AFTD offers an ever-growing network of support for people diagnosed with FTD, their families and friends, and the professionals who serve them. Uh, this includes our, the only helpline devoted specifically to FTD, and each call and email that we receive is answered individually by a specially trained AFTD staff member. Our Comstock Travel and Respite Grants provide direct assistance to help people attend an FTD conference or to use respite to recharge. And our newest initiative is a national network of affiliated FTD-specific support groups, which provides uh, group leaders with education, support, and networking with peers. If you're interested in any of these support opportunities, please let us know via our helpline, and we will have staff get back to you with more details. So uh, before beginning our presentation today, we also just want to highlight a few things that are going um, on here at AFTD and are on the horizon. Uh, so first, if you are um, uh, with us today as part of the educational series, um, which brings ex experts to you to address the important aspects of FTD care and research, the next, next installment of that will be on May 25th with Kate Rankin. Uh, who is a researcher from UCSF, the University of California, San Francisco, and she'll be presenting about behavioral variant FTD. We'll be sending more information about this shortly. And um, if you're an affiliated support group facilitator joining us today, the next training opportunity for you will be on February 2nd, and I'll be sending more reminders around that. Uh, the AFTD's sixth annual With Love campaign is right around the corner, and that's taking place throughout the month of February. So please consider sharing your story about a loved one affected by FTD while also raising awareness and funds to support AFTD's mission. For more information about that, uh, please contact our grassroots coordinator, Bridget Graham. And lastly, our AFTD's um, educational conference and annual meeting is this year on Friday, May 5th in Baltimore, Maryland. So registration for that is available online now. Um, so feel free to check out our website under the news and events for more information on how to register. Uh, we really hope that you're able to join us for that to learn from experts, network with other caregivers, and connect with other persons diagnosed. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alvin Holm. Dr. Holm is founder and director of the Cognitive and Behavioral Disorders Program at Bethesda Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. With more than 25 years' experience in adult medicine and neuropsychiatry, Dr. Holmes' clinical practice is entirely devoted to the evaluation and treatment of cognitive and behavioral disorders. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Holmes today and know that we all look forward to learning uh, from him more about how to best care for individuals with FTD. 
Bridget, thank you. And I want to welcome everyone who's online today. I'm very excited to be here and very excited to share some ideas with you and to receive your feedback. The other thing I'd like to do before we get started is just reach out to all of you. The, uh, the reality is that the FTD community is relatively small. And uh, there can be occasions where it can be hard to find help. And I just want to invite all of you to reach out to us. If you have a need, we're here for you. And whether it's in clinical practice or in research, um, uh, we're here and we want to help. And, and uh, you can always pick up the phone and call or, or connect with us by uh, e email as well. Today's talk is uh, titled A Care Paradigm for Persons with Frontotemporal Degeneration. And what we're going to explore is the process whereby we build a treatment program that can be effective uh, for someone afflicted uh, with this illness. I think as you'll, you'll see, uh, this is uh, maybe a bit more complex than what we might uh, tend to think of uh, when we see the doctor and, and, uh, and we're being treated for a problem. Uh, this, this is a journey and this is a process that is forged uh, over time uh, as we come to understand how an illness uh, uh, manifests itself in, uh, in a patient and how they respond to various uh, treatments. I'm looking for the control panel. I'm not seeing that. Um, just, there you go. Thank you. Okay, now I see it. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to start by uh, speaking or uh, by talking a little bit about how dementing illness manifests themselves. And before we get started, I just want to remind the audience that the term dementia is a categorical term. And we can succinctly define dementia as an acquired disorder of thinking and or behavioral impairment produced by an illness in the brain. And typically, we uh, we require that there be enough impairment in either cognitive or behavioral functions so as to render someone uh, at least a little bit functionally dependent. As such, uh, more than, or depending on how you count them, more than 100 illnesses fall under the rubric of dementia. And this is why it's so important to have an accurate diagnostic assessment uh, as best as we can perform so as to understand the nature of the illness, what we can expect from the illness, how best to treat the illness. Uh, and certainly we have lots of challenges in the area of frontotemporal dementia. Uh, but in terms of the manifestations of frontotemporal dementia, I've listed uh, four categories to consider here. The first are cognitive uh, signs of the illness. I would like to define cognition as uh, all aspects of thinking, remembering, and perceiving. It essentially is the manipulation of acquired knowledge. Uh, in frontotemporal dementia, we principally see one of two different types of cognitive impairments. The first we might uh, call higher order cognitive functions, uh, including uh, areas of judgment, insight, reasoning, problem solving and so on. Uh, we also see in many of forms of this illness and during the course of the illness impairments in language function. And this can involve the ability to express oneself, to produce sentences or words, to find words uh, during the course of conversation. It can also affect one's ability to understand what is being said to them, or what sometimes is referred to as receptive capabilities. Very commonly in frontotemporal dementia, uh, what we refer to as semantic knowledge, uh, a very important aspect of language where we link uh, word meaning to an object or to an idea becomes lost. Uh, and, and so uh, these are the two areas where we uh, see uh, many cognitive impairments, again, higher order or executive functions in language. We also can see other problems as well. It's not uncommon, uh, and maybe upwards of half of patients with frontotemporal dementia can suffer from impairment in short-term recall. We also very commonly see uh, problems with attentional function, uh, meaning that when, when a person has trouble attending to the environment, they can look very confused. 
there can be problems with spatial awareness and organization. And certainly, uh, I should mention that in, in terms of higher order functions, self-awareness becomes very impaired. You know, how, how are my behaviors impacting on my, on my partner, on my children? in my workplace, uh, think things of that sort. So certainly cognitive uh, impairments very, very important, but not always uh, the first sign of illness. Uh, the second category I listed here is functional, and we typically would break this into two categories. First are what are referred to as instrumental activities of daily living. These are, are functions that are required to live independently, the ability to be employed the ability to manage finances, uh, the ability to prepare a meal, to travel. Uh, these are, are instrumental to the ability to live independently in the community. Typ typically, in a neurodegenerative illness, it is these more complex functions that tend to be affected first uh, in an illness. But after time, uh, one can start seeing impairments within the area of activities of daily living or self-care as more basic functions, uh, things such as feeding and bathing and dressing uh, and so on. Uh, again, functional impairments don't have to be the first thing that one can see, but certainly uh, it's not uncommon that in, in, in behavioral variant forms of the illness, one can see problems with employment, for example. They may relate more to interpersonal behavior, uh, but, but uh, it's not uncommon that one of the first signs that we can see in a patient who comes to our clinic is that they've been having trouble uh, with stable employment uh, very commonly after maybe de decades of working for the same employer and having great success uh, in their jobs. A third and very important uh, area to consider are what are sometimes referred to as non-cognitive or behavioral manifestations. Uh, these are remarkably important in terms of the quality of life of patients who have an illness and the quality of life of caregivers and those charged in caring for a, a patient. In a broad sense, we oftentimes uh, speak in, in terms of someone with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia having changes in personal conduct, in activities that they may engage uh, in when they're by themselves, as well as in interpersonal behavior, uh, the, the, uh, the behaviors that they may demonstrate when in a social um, uh, in environment. Uh, if we narrow uh, our focus a little bit, we can begin to talk about things such as behavioral dysregulation, maybe in the form of agitation or activated behaviors. We can also see uh, uh, kind of repetitive or stereotypic behaviors, compulsive behaviors. Uh, we can see peer, or we can see states where someone is quite activated uh, when maybe they shouldn't be. And sometimes we'll, we'll speak more syndromically, uh, maybe uh, borrowing from, from primary psychiatry and, 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 and talk about the syndromes of depression or of mania or of mixed mood states. Uh, you, uh, the term bipolar might, might come to mind here. We can also see what we might refer to as psychosis, uh, a person experiencing uh, uh, you know, auditory uh, sensations or maybe seeing things that aren't really there or believing thoughts that aren't really true. Delirium can be very, very uh, common uh, as a syndrome and certainly, again, this idea of a mixed mood state, rapidly cycling uh, manic depressive illness or bipolar illness in, in the context of any uh, dementing illness and certainly in the neurodegenerative illnesses, we see a constellation of behaviors that seem to fit those categories of illness, and fortunately, uh, very oftentimes, uh, these uh, behaviors will respond to standard therapies. The last category uh, here is some something I think that's very, very impar or very, very important. And what's in, what's important to realize um, at the get-go is that frontotemporal dementia tends to afflict middle-aged and older adults, and it's very, very uh, well, I shouldn't say very uncommon, but certainly quite common that we're not going to see frontotemporal dementia in an isolated state, that frontotemporal dementia may occur in the context of chronic medical illness or may occur in the context of a longstanding mental health challenge. Uh, and it is, uh, I've listed here the standard trichotomy of medicine, 
medicine, psychiatry, and neurology. And it's, it's not uh, uh, uncommon, certainly in my practice, that we'll see manifestations of frontotemporal dementia that result from the interaction uh, of, of problems that might be uh, lumped into these three categories. Uh, so we might ask, you know, what, what might the effects be of untreated obstructive sleep apnea on the clinical presentation of behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia? In a few minutes, I'm going to present to you a case uh, that came to our clinic here within the last um, year that will will uh, greatly illustrate this problem. We might ask, what, what are the effects of the treatment of psychosis? on the neurological presentation of frontotemporal dementia. We know that patients with frontotemporal dementia are oftentimes very sensitive to certain classes of psychotropic therapies. Uh, and that might not be the case if we're dealing with someone who is psychotic who does not have an FTD. So here we're seeing an interaction between psychiatry, the treatment of psychosis, but in the context of a neurodegenerative illness. Uh, a, a third rhetorical uh, 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 question I might pose here, what are the effects of, of neurodegenerative disease on the treatment and responsiveness of the treatment of other medical problems? Many medical problems that we might treat, diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart disease, require the patient to be able to sense their bodies, to be able to report how they're feeling on treatment. They we require the patient to be compliant. Okay, what is the effect of neurodegeneration on one's ability to remain compliant? Uh, very, very commonly uh, in an Alzheimer patient, as an example, who might be suffering from high blood pressure, they're seeing their doctor and they have high blood pressure and they might be started on a low dose of a beta blocker and the blood pressure remains high and then we might add a diuretic and the blood pressure remains high and we might add another class of medicine, maybe an ACE inhibitor, and the blood pressure remains high. Not because the patient has refractory hypertension, but because the patient is not compliant with their medicines. Then the patient has an occasion to find them, themselves in the hospital where all of a sudden medication compliance is, is, is assured and, and before too many hours pass in the hospital, we're in a crisis where the patient has been effectively given an overdose of medicine, uh, believing that they had been compliant. So here again, we have an interaction between a, the neurologic consequences of an illness and how we perceive and how we manage medical problems. And I like to refer to these as in interface uh, problems and patients with this, we might say, Venn diagram of overlapping psychiatric, neurologic, and medical problems as interface patients. Many of you uh, may uh, have th this experience. Uh, you have seen a fine neurologist who has rendered a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. You may have had to travel quite a long way to see this person. The primary care doctor, who's also very good, uh, is managing most aspects of care but does not feel comfortable in managing the psychiatric problem, so he may refer to a psychiatrist. So now we have three do doctors that are involved in care and there's nothing wrong with that and that can work very well. But, but, but quite commonly, if, a, if an internal medicine doctor sees a patient with a delirium who has frontotemporal dementia, they may assume that this is a problem for the psychiatrist when in fact it's an in interface problem related to a medical illness that the internist is not able to identify because of the interaction of, of, uh, of the neurodegenerative illness uh, on this patient. And so they present very atypically when it comes to medical problems. And again, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at a case here and, uh, and try to il illustrate that point. Okay. Okay. So now uh, we're lo looking at the care paradigm, and this is a visual cue to uh, all those online. Uh, this is a model of care that outlines the what I like to refer to as the three broad domains of intervention in developing a treatment program, really for anyone with a neurodegenerative illness. But today we're talking about FTD. We have three domains of intervention. The first are disease-specific therapies. 
There are, uh, for many neurodegenerative illnesses, uh, FDA-approved medicines that are intended to target the pathophysiologic or pathobiological problems that a person is struggling with when they have a certain illness. I, one can think of Alzheimer's disease and the fact that we do have FDA-approved medicines that are specifically designed to treat Alzheimer's disease. That's the first domain. The second domain is wellness. And nobody thinks well if they're sick. We've all had that experience. And when you have a chronic medical illness and you become acutely ill, you do not think well. And I would submit to everyone uh, out there today that when you have a chronic illness of the brain, it's remarkably important that we manage wellness. Because very commonly, when you have a chronic illness of the brain and you become acutely ill, brain function tends to decline. And very commonly, that will manifest itself as a delirium or confusion. In frontotemporal dementia, it can also result uh, sometimes in aggressive or violent behaviors as well. So wellness management, remarkably important. And then, as important, is environmental support. There are environments that work well for all of us. And again, when we're saddled with chronic illness, our tolerances for changes or disruptions in the environment become a bit less. And again, I would submit that when we're dealing with chronic illnesses of the brain, those tolerances are more narrow. So very, very commonly, some of the greatest challenges that we can see in a patient who suffers from FTD is uh, an inadequately structured environment. And very, very commonly, if we're not recognizing the importance of environmental influence on the well-being of the patient as well as the caregiver, we likely are going to go down the pathway of trying to address these problems in a very inappropriate way. Here in my hospital, uh, for 24 years, we had an inpatient treatment program that was designed to uh, effectively evaluate and treat severe behavioral disturbances occurring in patients who suffered from neurodegenerative brain disease. And over those 24 years, we treated more than 10,000 patients. And one uh, thing that we learned very er early, and, uh, and uh, forgive me. One thing we've learned very early, and it seemed to, to remain true uh, through uh, those 24 years, was that the number one reason for the inappropriate overuse of medication therapies in the treatment of behavioral disturbances in these patients was that these patients were living in environments that were too challenging for them. And people might see the, the behavioral syndrome of delirium or depression or psychosis and believe that they needed to be medicated when really what they needed was an appropriate environment in which to live. So again, environmental support, very, very important. Wellness management, very, very important. Wellness management and environmental support represent the foundation of good treatment of a chronic illness. Disease-specific therapies, uh, and as we'll talk about here in a minute, which we don't have uh, exactly right now for frontotemporal dementia, when we have them, they'll work wonderfully well only when we get the wellness piece down and when we get the environmental uh, uh, support piece down. Now, at the bottom of the slide, you can see a statement. And I'll just read it here. Effective treatment programs are developed and adjusted longitudinally depending on the needs of the patient, uh, the caregiver, and the family. For those of you who've had some experience with frontotemporal dementia, you know that these illnesses evolve over time. And we also know that as a result of the evolution of frontotemporal dementia, the manifestations of the illness change over time. And the need to treat patients can change over time. And the responsiveness of the patient to any particular treatment can change over time. So this is a moving target. This is a journey. Progr uh, effective treatment programs are forged. The, they are not point in time in encounters with the doctor. You know, I, I like to tell people, we're not treating strep throat here. It's not like, here's your penicillin, and we'll see you in a year, and you'll be fine. That's not how this works. And this is why it's remarkably important to have some continuity in care. You need to get to know your care provider, and you need to trust them. Uh, sometimes there are empirical 
therapies that need to be implied. We need to try some things and see how things go. Uh, but this is, um, it, it's very achievable, uh, but it's a bit of work uh, to find a program that works well for a patient. Uh, and so again, think, think of this uh, as a journey. Okay, so let's break this down just a little bit and spend a little more time. And let's take the first uh, category or first domain, that of disease-specific therapies. I've, I've, again, broken it down into two uh, groups. The first are preventative therapies, and the second are symptomatic therapies. Preventative therapies can be uh, thought of as either being primary or secondary. Uh, first, realize that uh, neurodegenerative brain diseases exist in the brain for many, many years before they become clinically evident. Uh, we know, for example, in Alzheimer's disease that the pathobiological processes that lead to this illness uh, are established in the brain at least 15 years before a person has any symptoms. Okay, and And so if we think of primary prevention, we might think of, is there a way that we could provide a treatment that would prevent the pathogenic process from getting a foothold? You know, that is, prevent the entire course of the illness, both the pre-symptomatic and then, of course, the, the symptomatic stage. This is, there's some work going on in this area, uh, but most of the work is going on in terms of secondary prevention. Here, the pathogenic process has begun. And, and a person uh, may be suffering from the disease frontotemporal dementia, let's say for maybe 15 years or so before they come to diagnosis, maybe we could apply a treatment that will alter the trajectory of that change so that the, so that the neurodegenerative process slows down in the brain or may, maybe stops. Okay, this is where most of the work is taking place uh, in terms of treatments. Uh, and again, uh, really in all neurodegenerative illnesses, uh, we've dialed you know, the clock back. We're, we're trying to treat, uh, or researchers are trying to treat, with, uh, treat their patients in the pre-symptomatic stage. And many of you, again, might know of, of work going on in Alzheimer's disease, where many of the therapeutic trials have kind of fallen flat. But now they've been retooled and they're being administered to patients that are well within the pre-symptomatic stage of illness. You know, the idea of calling the fire department when we smell smoke, not when the fire has burned the house down to the, you know, the studs, that, that we're getting to the, the process to try and bend that curve so that a person may not become symptomatic at 70, maybe they become symptomatic at the age of 90, and, and we might effective, or we might affect a, a clinical cure, the person never really has problems. That's where a lot of the work is, is, is being targeted now. Uh, and the, the thought is that, that we know and we've learned a lot more about frontotemporal dementia in a much shorter time than we have with Alzheimer's. I think there are many researchers who believe that the first disease-modifying therapies for these illnesses will be found for frontotemporal dementia. Then the second category here are symptomatic therapies, uh, and these might target some uh, pathogenic process or symptom of the illness. Again, I might think of Alzheimer's disease as an example here, that, that we have symptomatic therapies that actually can do some very nice things uh, in terms of, of targeting some of the uh, altered neurotransmitter um, uh, uh, or the, the, that are tar targeting uh, uh, changes in, in neurotransmitter systems within the brain. Again, we don't have FDA-approved medicines for frontotemporal dementia, but you know we're getting pretty close. I mean, we know a lot about the illness. So, for example, we know that a neurotransmitter uh, referred to as serotonin is affected in frontotemporal dementia, and we might therefore uh, think that serotonin active medications such as uh, serotonin active antidepressant medicines might be of some benefit. Certainly clinically we see that they can help. Um, uh, there is some work going on with dopamine, another neurotransmitter that may be involved in some forms of frontotemporal dementia. For those of you who might be familiar with a, uh, an illness called a PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy, um, there is some evidence that coenzyme Q10 can be of benefit there. So I, I think we're getting close, uh, but as of yet, no FDA-approved medicines. What are the challenges that we face uh, in developing effective treatments? Well, I think one of the greatest challenges is can we get enough patients 
into clinical trials. Remember, frontotemporal dementia is not a fairly con or is a fairly unusual illness. In fact, it's so unusual there are many doctors who've never heard of it. Um, frontotemporal dementia is 200 times less prevalent than Alzheimer's disease. You know, everyone's had experience with Alzheimer's disease, uh, but uh, there, there aren't very many relative uh, to patients with Alzheimer's. Uh, there aren't many people with frontotemporal. And uh, researchers need to have pools of patients that they can enroll in treatment trials. And certainly there's a lot of work going on to uh, develop registries of patients and families with frontotemporal dementia so as to maybe be able to get enough patients to do trials. Uh, at the international conference on FTD in Munich last fall, there were three trials that were presented. And uh, none of these trials uh, showed any breakthrough, but I thought the breakthrough was the fact that they could actually recruit enough patients to do a trial. So I think they're going to get there. But certainly that's a, a great challenge. One of the other challenges is having adequate markers of the illness. Uh, when we apply treatments, uh, uh, we've got to know if they're having an effect, and certainly one can can observe a patient to see if there are effects. But we also need what are called biomarkers uh, that can that can uh, tell us whether the treatments that we're applying are having uh, an effect on the pathophysiological process going on in the brain. That that's been a challenge. Uh, there are some targets uh, or some compounds or proteins that are are felt to maybe represent. Uh, uh, good uh, markers of of the state of an illness. Uh, there's something called neurofilament light chain, and I think it, there's a lot of excitement about that as being a biomarker. But again, can we get enough patients into re research? I think I think they can. Uh, two, we need development of good assessment tools, uh, and uh, and I think that there is pro progress in all these areas. But it is a bit more challenging because. Uh, it's just simply not as common an illness as, let's say, Alzheimer's disease. So we're going to take a break here and maybe ask for some feedback from the audience with respect to disease-specific therapies or anything that we've uh, talked about uh, thus far. So, uh, Dr. Holm, this is Bridget. I um, am going to be fielding the questions for folks today. So if anyone has any, feel free to type them into that chat box again. Um, that's how we're going to be uh, learning what your questions are. Um, so we have two. The first one is um, not having obviously gone through the whole paradigm yet, um, but this being specific to the, the medical piece, um, how would you say that you would advocate for loved ones across the paradigm um, when maybe the medical or, or even wider community uh, really don't have a good knowledge base of FTD? Well, that's a, that's a, a great question and it's a challenging problem. I think. I think that uh, all of us, uh, whether we suffer from the illness or have a loved one or if we care for someone with these illnesses, have a responsibility to be advocates. I think we need to advocate uh, for good care. And, uh, and those, that, that may lead in time to changes within the system. Here's what, um, but for your loved one, the most powerful intervention I think that you can make is know as much as you can about frontotemporal dementia. You know, use uh, your colleagues at AFTD or your contacts. You can call me. You can, you know, any anyone in your community who has knowledge support groups. The more you know about the illness the less anxiety you will have about the illness, the more confidence you will have in terms of trying to manage the illness, and the better your loved one will do. Yeah, but it is a challenge uh, because the systems of medicine that are in place today, you know, it, it's a bit of a challenge to, to effectively develop uh, care programs that are built longitudinally. Again, our, our business model of medicine, you know, it works well for strep throat, it works well for high blood pressure, but this is something that uh, these treatment programs develop over months to years. And it works very, very well, but it does require continuity. It does require that you are interfacing with someone who cares about the illness and has some knowledge about the illness. Uh, and so we are challenged uh, because, uh, because of, of some, some of the realities of our healthcare system today, and because of the reality that frontotemporal dementia is, in many respects, an interface problem. It, 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 it touches on all areas of medicine and requires a very integrated approach in order to uh, treat well. 
Great, thank you. Um, and another one that came through is, are environmental support systems um, different for different variants of FTD? So I know we haven't necessarily talked through the environmental piece yet, um, but maybe just an, a quick overview sure. on that. Well, I think that I think that um, yeah, fundamentally no, but it, but there may be a difference in terms of the um, intensity with which one may need to focus. Certainly, behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia is the variant form where environmental support is so critical. Uh, that may be less the case if we're dealing sim simply with language uh, involvement. But again, realize that that these illnesses. Um, evolve over time as the illness spreads in the brain. And so it's not uncommon for someone to, who might you know, first show themselves as, let, let's say, a language variant frontotemporal dementia, maybe uh, achromatic PPA, then begin to look much more behavioral. So again, the need to be flexible and the need to to uh, adjust the treatments. You know, we might say that if you have lang language variants, yes, there is a need for structure. We all have that. But if we start seeing more behavioral uh, manifestations of the illness, we may need to tighten up the environment. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Uh, and maybe this can be uh, the last one for now, or maybe one more. But um, you mentioned earlier about the serotonin. And someone was asking if there would be any harm in having an FCD patient take a serotonin supplement. A serotonin supplement. Um, well, I think that uh, I think that what's implied there in the in, in the question is that the person may not have any particular problems. Uh, they may be doing reasonably well. Would there be any problem with with monkeying around with serotonin system. I, I, I probably would avoid that. Uh, there's a lot that we know about frontotemporal dementia. There's a lot we don't know. But one of the principles of good, effective treatment is to minimize uncertainty. And what I mean by that is that when we have a lot of treatments going, um, and patients aren't doing well, we have lots of variables. You know, Could it be that we need more treatments? Or could it be that the treatments themselves are part of the problem? You know, if 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 I had a patient, uh, for example, with frontotemporal, let, let's say they have behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, and they're doing very well, and I put them on a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Let's say I put them on citalopram. Let's say, and, and they're not having any problems at all. Let's say a month later they come in with a problem. They're coming in with a behavior. A fundamental question that needs to be asked, of course, is could the medicine I gave them be part of the problem? So what, what we've done is that we've added some complexity to a treatment program when we really didn't need to do that. And now that we're faced with a, a clinical challenge, we have to ask ourselves if the treatment is part of the problem. I would tend to avoid. Um, uh, treating patients who don't clearly have a need for treatment just to minimize that uncertainty. Because those challenges are going, to, are going to come in an illness like this. And the fewer medicines, for example, that you have on board, the less uncertainty you may have with respect to what's causing the problem. OK. Hey, thank well, you. We go? Um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, did, I was going to say the same thing. We're on the same page. Got it. All right, so here we go. And we're going to talk about wellness management. Very important. Okay, uh, it's a fundamental aspect of the treatment of any chronic illness, and remarkably important when we're speaking about chronic illnesses of the brain. What are we saying here? We want thoughtful treatment of existing illnesses, and what I mean by that is we want to consider frontotemporal dementia when we're treating diabetes. What am I saying? Well, maybe we want to simplify the regimen. Maybe we want to abandon four times a day blood sugar checks. Maybe we want to Im implement certain approaches with respect to dietary management. Clearly, the treatment of diabetes in the context of frontotemporal dementia presents its own unique challenges. So we don't want to exacerbate behaviors because we're being unreasonable with respect to blood sugar management or the treatment thereof. We also want to identify and treat new illnesses. Very commonly, uh, we have uh, you know, problems with uh, neuropsychiatric uh, uh, or, or behavioral problems that, that need to be managed. But beyond that, we also want to focus on diet. We want to focus on physical activity. We want to focus on daily routine. All the things that we wrap into a wellness program for all of us. 
become more important as we get older, become more important as we have chronic illnesses, and I would submit become even more important when we're dealing with chronic illnesses of the brain. Okay. Again, when disease-specific therapies come, they will do you no good if we don't get the fundamentals of wellness down. Okay. Very, very important. And this last point to be highlighted is as part of wellness management, we need to think of the caregiver. Okay, dementias affect families, and patients with dementia do not do well with their illness if their caregiver is not doing well. So part of wellness management is to make sure that the caregiver is being ta taken care of. When I have, um, have re residents uh, come in and, and rotate through my clinic, I tell them, every patient in, in my exam rooms, there's more than one patient in there. There are two patients. There's the patient and there's the caretaker. We have to have everyone involved in wellness management in order to have success uh, in treating uh, long-term this Ill illness. Let me um, take a look at a couple of notes here. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to present a, a case here that has to do with wellness management, and it has to do with the interface between medicine, neurology, and psychiatry, as we talk, talked about at the beginning of my talk. And this is a 48-year-old male who was brought into my clinic within the past year for a second opinion. He had been diagnosed with uh, dementia due to alcohol abuse and psychosis. And we, uh, I was told that he had a history of heavy al alcohol use in the past, but had uh, abstained from drinking approximately five years ago and what was curious was that following discon or discontinuation of consumption, uh, he lost his job. I mean, most people lose their job while they're drinking. This man had stopped drinking, and then he lost his job. He then was uh, divorced from his wife. He moved in with his mother. But despite sobriety, over time, there were changes in his behavior. Uh, and the mother described him as being very impulsive, also at times very apathetic. He engaged in stereotypic behaviors. He then started having more trouble with insomnia and restless and fidgeting type behaviors. And these behaviors were associated with occasional agitated outbursts. These were directed towards his mother. He became violent with his mother on several occasions and was arrested by the police, taken to an inpatient psychiatry unit where he was given the above noted diagnoses. Now, when I saw him, what was most remarkable was he looked very Parkinsonian. He, he was on a medicine called Prosperidone, and this medicine was making him very rigid. Uh, he had some tremors of the, uh, of the arms. Uh, he had a, a bit of a hard time walking. But the other thing that was really remarkable about him was that he was remarkably indifferent uh, to his environment, remarkably indifferent to his mother, and it looked um, very much like what we commonly see in, in the behavioral variant form of frontal temporal dementia. Uh, again, he was receiving six milligrams of risperidone per day, which is a fairly high dose for anybody. Um, I did uh, a, a medical evaluation, which was completely uh, normal. And, uh, and, oh, and I did get a, a chance to uh, review an MRI of the brain that had been uh, performed. And, and the, yeah, uh, the MRI was, uh, was interpreted as showing mild shrinkage of the brain. But the reality was there was a little more shrinkage in what we call the prefrontal cortex, just the very front tip of the brain. And this man, uh, based on, on the M MRI and based on what the mother was telling me, really met criteria for probable behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia. And that was our, our preliminary diagnosis from, from, uh, from day one. The other thing that we thought was that he had significant Parkinsonism because as we've talked about, patients with frontal temporal dementia can, uh, can have lots of trouble uh, with antipsychotic medications. If you give the wrong uh, medication, you can make these patients look like they have Parkinson's disease. So we intervened by tapering and discontinuing his risperidone. His motor status improved very greatly. We were seeing much more evidence of depression uh, once uh, we got rid of the uh, of the antipsychotic. And the other thing that was really odd about uh, his presentation when I first met him and through the first one or two follow-ups was he was remarkably confused. 
more confused than than I uh, thought was normal for behavioral variant. Uh, and we looked high and low for medical problems, uh, and we weren't finding anything. And then it just by chance, and, and this was a, a fairly thin man, the mother had remarked to me, or we were talking, that he that her son snored a lot. And I asked her to observe his breathing when he was sleeping. Now, he was very insomniac, but he would sleep from time to time. And sure enough, there were apneic periods. And we got to wondering, could this man have obstructive sleep apnea? We know that untreated obstructive sleep apnea affects the front of the brain and can cause confusion. And certainly, in the context of a neurodegenerative disease, might produce a profound confusion. One problem we had, though, was could this man go through a formal sleep study? We did not think that we could do that. So we did a very simple, what's called overnight O2 SAT study. This is where we put a probe on the finger when the person's asleep to see if we can capture periods where they desaturate, de where the O2 level in their bloodstream goes very low. And sure enough, uh, this man had remarkable periods where he would desat. Uh, me, meaning that he wasn't getting oxygen to his brain. And, uh, and again, uh, we were saddled with the question, could he really tolerate a standard obstructive sleep apnea treatment, which involves strapping a mask on the face? We didn't think so. We tried low flow O2 delivered through a na nasal prong uh, de device. And sure enough, uh, low flow O2 allowed uh, this man to regulate his sleep-wake patterns. He was able to sleep at night, and during the day he was much less confused, and his violent behaviors went away. And this is off of all sites like psychotropic therapy. So this is an example of a man with a neuropsychiatric problem that we might attribute to frontotemporal dementia. But if we were to solely attribute it to frontotemporal dementia, we would be treating him with psychoactive therapies to treat his violent behavior when really what he needed was o oxygen. Low flow O2 cured his insomnia, dramatically improved his, his uh, confusion, and eliminated this dangerous behavior that was leading to arrest. Okay. And this is not uncommon. Again, that, that very, very commonly we're dealing with the interface between these areas of medicine. And these are the great challenges. Uh, when we're trying to provide good care to someone. Sometimes we need to think outside of the box. Okay? Again, frontotemporal dementias can occur alone, but very commonly they don't. There are other problems that we're, we're attempting to deal with. So an example of an interface patient and an example of wellness management, uh, maybe an example of keeping an open mind about maybe how we need to approach uh, the management of problems. So, uh, right, thanks, questions Kevin. about wellness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have a couple that have um, come through, and I think I'm going to start with. Um, so I know we here at AFTD we often hear that families struggle the most with kind of wanting to provide the best quality of life for their person, their loved one that's diagnosed, and um, FTD's kind of arguably hardest sy symptom, if you will, is really that apathy. And so how would you best engage with someone with these aspects in terms of physical activity, diet, um, et cetera, particularly in the early stage when they can be mobile but don't want to be, or if they're eating but not right um, and you know, uh, aren't able to kind of do things safely in terms of exercise, those kinds of things? You well, know, it's a great challenge, and I don't think that there's a prescription that works for, you know, one size of fit fits all. I think that this is, you know, where we might talk about the art of medicine. Very commonly, uh, it, when patients have apathy, it's probably not adequate or not effective to, let's say, ask them, would you like to go for a walk? Or, I think it's time, Tom, for you to do your, you know, PT program today. Uh, it's better uh, to maybe try to uh, to cue them, to lead them. You know, it's it's not. Um, would you like to go for a walk? It's more like here we go. And sometimes by taking someone by the hand, you can get them up and walk them. Remember, in frontal temporal dementia, very commonly, there is something called inertia. That is, one a, a person begins to engage in activity. Sometimes it's hard to stop them. Uh, as well, it's hard to get them engaged. So. 
sometimes you can use um, those those traits to one's advantage in terms of, of getting them up and moving, but there is a limit, of course, and uh, certainly it, one can encourage engagement in these activities to the extent that someone might become more agitated or irritable. We certainly don't want that. Um, sometimes it's a matter of, of finding the opportunity. You know, a apathy is not always an all or none thing. It's not like, well, we can motivate or we can't motivate. Uh, many of you know this, that, that there are times when your loved one is a apathetic. There are times when they're more motivated. So it may be that you need to uh, be flexible with respect to when you'd be willing to, let's say, walk with your loved one. And, and and take advantage of, a, a, of an opening, a, a, a moment in time when they seem to be more willing to do that. You know, when it comes to oral intake, I think uh, very commonly, we'll talk about this with respect to environmental support, but, but um, very commonly that's maybe more of a simple environmental thing. You know, maybe securing food if there's overconsumption. Maybe parsing out a meal as opposed to setting a full plate of, of food in front of a pa patient. Um, but again, um, uh, these are, are maybe goals to strive for, uh, but uh, there will be fits and starts and lots of trial and error. And you will definitely find periods where engagement is more readily achieved uh, and times when, when one can't do that. Um, you know, I like to remind um, my patients and families that in a medical environment, we're practicing medicine, we're not, we're not playing God. What, what the great challenge is, is to know when we can have a meaningful impact and when we can't have one. And that can be uh, very uh, challenging. You know, when a doctor fails, um, you know, let's say to, I don't know, treat a depressive illness in the patient, it's maybe a simple thing to say, well, they can't get better because they haven't gotten better with what I've given them. The harder question to ask is, what am I not doing as a doctor? How, how am I not viewing this problem appropriately to achieve a good outcome? Uh, there are times in neurodegenerative illness where I think it's reasonable to believe that you can't uh, achieve a good out, outcome with respect to intervention, but that's more in a more advanced stage of illness. Uh, many of these, uh, many of these goals uh, in developing a treatment program can be achieved, but it does require creativity. It requires creativity on the part of the care provider. It requires creativity on the part of the caregiver. Great, thank you. Uh, and one of the other questions that came in as as you were talking. Um, what are your go-to suggestions for caregivers related to good self-care practices? Well, I think that I, I think that it's it's uh, important to try and maintain a routine. Again, regimentation of a da daily routine, in my experience, has been somewhat helpful uh, in terms of you know a time for self-cares a time for naps, a time for meal time. Uh, again, I think we all do well with that, but certainly we do we do better with, or relatively speaking, we do better with that when we're, we're suffering from chronic illness. You know, again, re, there's, the, I, I think it, it's important not to, um, to uh, become too complacent. Uh, I think reapproach is appropriate. Um, I think that um, that one needs to to experiment again, to kind of think outside the box of ways to to provide cares. Um, we've actually, in my clinic, uh, we've demonstrated how to give sponge baths to our pay patients in the office um, uh, when we're having trouble with per personal cares. Certainly, the inability to provide enough personal care risks uh, displacement from the home and in the uh, in the in, or with the goal of trying to maintain someone within the home we definitely need to, to you know to to work at this so so there are maybe a number of tricks but in in terms of general approaches here I think reg regimenting a routine uh, during the day can be helpful uh, but yet retaining enough flexibility so that we're not fighting, uh, fighting battle royale to get you know cares done. Uh, in my treatment program, there would be days when we weren't able to do per personal cares. We felt that it was just 
too costly, and then we would, you know, reapproach the next day or maybe adjust the treatment. Tough, tough problem. Um, and this also is specifically for um, the caregivers, this question, and it says, do you find that caregivers are more frequently prescribed medications for mental illness such as depression and anxiety? Yes, uh, and we, I don't know that I know of comparable data for frontotemporal dementia, but I'll, I'll give you some insights. We know that 40% of, of caregivers of patients with Alzheimer's disease suffer from depression. We know that caregiver burden is, is, uh, is about equivalent between frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's when we're not dealing with the behavioral variant form. So if we're dealing with a language variant form, um, uh, those care burdens are about the same. But in behavioral variant, the caregiver burden is much greater. So my guess would be that we're dealing with a fairly high prevalence of, of anxiety and depression in caregivers in frontal temporal dementia. And, and forgive me, I, that data may be out there. But, but uh, again, it's so critically important that the caregiver remains well. You know, I tell my, my caregivers, you know, you're not going to serve yourself and you're not going to serve your loved one if you work yourself into the grave. Uh, you have to take care of yourself. You have to be a bit selfish because all the studies show that the people that do the best with these illnesses have dedicated families. Okay. So it's it's very important uh, to, to maintain uh, uh, for the caregiver to think of themselves and to maintain themselves for their own sake and for the sake of their loved one. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's probably best to move on. We have a couple environmental questions, so why don't we move on to that section and then we can get those uh, questions answered. Thanks. So the last, uh, the last of these three broad domains is environmental support. And I want to direct you to the statement uh, at the bottom of the slide. Environmental support is to a patient with frontotemporal dementia what a prosthetic limb is to an amputee. I like to tell my families that, um, that uh, environmental support, particularly in behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, is foundational to successful management. It is wholly under-recognized, but remarkably important. In fact, I would venture to say that it's probably the most important aspect of management. Uh, many of the behaviors that we can see in behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia are not secondary to treatable psychiatric illness or psychiatric comorbidities. They're due to the neurodegenerative process itself. And uh, structured environments are remarkably therapeutic. In fact, very commonly uh, in the early stages of behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia, if a patient is living within a well-structured environment, you can't tell that they have any problems with brain function. You know, the frontal lobes, uh, one of the areas anatomically, the front of the brain, that is involved in frontal temporal dementia is the part of the brain that allows us to create order out of a very chaotic world. It's that part of the brain that, that provides us with the structure for us to accomplish tasks, you know, to go to work and get our bills paid. And this becomes, um, you know, uh, uh, impaired in frontal temporal dementia. Uh, and very commonly, we become aware of this illness when a person's in an unstructured environment and they're unable to structure. You know, they're unable to get their job done. They're unable to, you know, manage their, their personal cares within the home setting. So remarkably important and very commonly overlooked aspect of care. Um, I listed here three areas of support. Uh, environmental support is, by the way, uh, at times kind of a difficult concept. You know, what are, exactly are we talking about? Well, let's talk a little bit about the physical environment. Um, uh, home environments weren't designed for people with frontotemporal dementia. They were designed for people that could make choices and create their own structure. Uh, what we're talking about with respect to the physical environment is a, a, a stable and predictable physical environment that doesn't really change a lot. Okay, uh, it may be fairly uh, simple with with respect to not a lot of clutter, good lighting, not a lot of things to get into that might cause problems, uh, but really stability. You know, we'll we'll see many many patients who do wonderfully well 
in a structured environment. In fact, they're doing so well that the family thinks that we can take a trip out to Seattle. You know, where I'm here in the mid Midwest. And in the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport, you know, everything falls apart because now we're in a very different environment that's very disrupted. Okay, more sounds, more lights. Uh, you know, you have to do things uh, within a certain period of time, uh, and and what that tells us is that the physical environment is remarkably important, uh, and the stability of the physical environment becomes more and more important as these illnesses advance. And that's not just for frontotemporal dementia; it's for all the neurodegenerative illnesses. Uh, remember what I said, uh, that the uh, lack of attention to physical environment oftentimes leads to over-medicating patients who suffer from neurodegenerative problems because they become anxious and agitated. Uh, you know, we, we might look at the paradigm there on the right. Now, we don't have uh, a, any deep disease uh, precise therapies here, uh, but if we have wellness down uh, and 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 but we don't have the environmental support piece down, and a patient becomes confused, they become psychotic. If we're not thinking of environment, we're going to go to the wellness model, and we're going to treat. We're going to have a medicine for insomnia, you know, which isn't going to be O2 unless we diagnose you know, the medical problem, but uh, a medicine for insomnia, a medicine for violent behavior, medicine for depression, medicine for mania, pharmacological band-aids that are being applied to the patient when they really need attention to the environment. So the physical environment, very, very important. You know, we, I think we touched on, on, on oral intake, and very commonly uh, overeating can be a problem. Uh, that might require a physical environment um, intervention where we secure the food in the home. You know, I had one patient uh, who got into trouble uh, again. Um, uh, this man had what's called semantic dementia, a language variant form of the illness, and he was engaged in a very, uh, very complex what we call stereotyping. At 9 o'clock in the morning, every day, he would get into his car and drive clockwise around the block where he lived. And there was a bus stop on one corner, and there was a young lady there one morning. And uh, this man, every time he would pass, uh, this young lady would stop and, and ask her if she needed a ride. And after the third time, uh, she called the police. And, and this man had come to me uh, after he was arrested, and we diagnosed him. And the family wanted to know if there was a, a medicine that I could give him that would cause him not to do this. And of course, there isn't a medicine. I informed the family that we needed to take the car keys away. You know, very simple, uh, but environmental approach to this problem, and that solved the problem. Okay, there's a caregiver environment. We as caregivers are in the environment, and we're setting rules, and we're responding, uh, and and again, we're concerned about our wellness. Very commonly, uh, we'll see patients that have multiple caregivers. You know, families divide and conquer, and you know, spend time with lo loved ones. Uh, the inconsistency of the of the caregiver's influence on the environment can be a big problem. So we want to be, uh, or we want to encourage consistency on the part of the caregiver in providing cares. Uh, again, I think the timing of cares can be very, very important. Uh, but certainly, the the caregiver um, uh, has a a huge role to play. If the caregiver is not doing well, if they're suffering from depression or anxiety, their contribution to the environment can be you know, problematic, not only for themselves, but for their, their loved one. And then there's a, a third category here that I, that I uh, dreamed up. And I've, I've called it the expectational environment. And let me give you an example of this. Uh, again, when we had an inpatient treatment program, it was not uncommon that we would be uh, that we would receive from an acute care facility a patient with frontotemporal dementia, and they would come to us on this kind of soup of psychoactive therapies that had been provided to the patient in the uh, acute setting. They might go to the acute setting because they were aggressive or or they couldn't be cared for at home, and we would get these patients. And of course, the question was. Why are they receiving these medicines? What is the hypothesis that's being treated? And, and what we would find is that these therapies were given to the patient because they were violating the rules of the acute care facility. You know, one rule might be you don't wander into someone else's room. You might be asked to use your call light. You know, you you might be asked to to you know 
behave in a certain way. So there is an expectation when you go to the hospital that you're going to play by the rules. And when you have frontotemporal dementia or when you have other neurodegenerative illnesses, if you're not playing by the rules, very commonly you get medicated. You know, I've always thought it's really, it's really curious. I mean, everybody can have a bad day, right? I mean, we all have bad days. Well, if you have dementia and you have a bad day, that's used as a justification to kind of micromanage psychoactive medicine. You know, it's not, you know, that's not what we need to be doing. So if we, if, we, if, if we have expectations of anyone that they can't meet, okay, uh, they're going to have trouble. And when you have frontotemporal dementia, we have, to be, we have to be understanding that there are certain things that we can't expect a person to do. You know, very commonly uh, in, in the behavioral variant form of this illness, my patients get arrested for shoplifting, all right? Arrested for acting oddly in, you know, in public or being, maybe being violent. And the, rea and the reality is that these things are never really malevolent. These people aren't, I mean, we know that they're not intending on hurting people. These things happen because they're poorly thought out. Someone's very impulsive. They're not able to, to respond to the cues in the environment. Uh, we can't expect a person with a, an illness in the brain to be normal. You know, we have to adjust the environment. You know, another way to look at this, and I've, I've talked with my, my administrative colleagues in Health, Health East when they have these, these problems, that, you know, it's not a matter of medicating the patient so that they fit into the environment of the acute care setting. It's that we need to adjust the environment of the acute care setting to meet the needs of the patient. Okay, so yeah, you know, again, we need to have uh, a realistic set of expectations. We need to have a appropriate, structured, and consistent physical environment, and we need to have consistency with respect to how we provide cares to the patient in order to round out uh, that environmental support piece. I will tell you that while I think it is laudable that patients receive care within the home very commonly that can't be maintained and and we need to to uh, uh, to have our, our loved ones within a structured uh, setting outside of the home you know uh, uh, and sometimes when or, and very often when that's needed uh, things can go very well in my experience the greatest challenge in terms of, of a placement uh, has to do with the staff of the facility understanding the differences between what they commonly see, that is Alzheimer's disease, and what they rarely see, which is frontotemporal dementia. Here in St. Paul, what, what my group does is we go out and give in services whenever we have a patient who goes to a long-term care facility. If they don't know much about frontotemporal dementia, we'll go out and give an in-service. But as you know, as many of you know, uh, frontotemporal dementia, in many respects, is diametrically opposed in terms of what we see. Uh, uh, compared with what we uh, observe in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, let's move on here. So let's just, uh, any questions about, uh, about environmental support? Yeah, so there were actually a few about the facility piece, and it sounds like you maybe touched on that a little bit um, between, you know, kind of, not necessarily adjusting the patient to the environment, but in adjusting the environment to the patient. Um, and so things like, you know, doing well and better in a structured environment such as a facility, um, you know, oftentimes is the best solution. Um, but for those families that are struggling, um, you know, with that day-to-day -day who maybe either can't afford an in-home care or a, um, or a facility or don't want to move their loved ones to a facility, um, what advice can you give them in terms of putting this paradigm into action um, within, you know, the environment in the home? Sure. Well, the first thing is that I think that we need to be very, uh, very attentive to distractors in the environment. Uh, our ability to attend, to concentrate on the environment, uh, becomes greatly impaired when we have an illness like this. So we want to limit noise. We want to sometimes limit um, uh, activities. You know, there there is a fine balance. Of course, we don't want to to uh, to make the environment so there's nothing to st stimulate, but we don't want to be overly st stimulating. So we might think of an example might be the holiday family gathering. 
you know, you've got uh, 15 people in the house who are all talking at one time. We've got two big screen TVs. We've got the dog. We've got the parakeet. There's lots of things going on. Many patients who, who have a frontal lobe impairment, irrespective of the cause, strokes or neurodegenerative uh, illness, can't manage those environments. And what happens is they'll get agitated or they'll get confused. Watch your loved one. I mean, they're a good barometer of where they're at. When they're not doing well uh, at home, you know, ask that question. Is there too much noise? Is it time maybe to quiet the environment? Uh, remove clutter, okay? Um, be mindful of what your loved one seems to get in trouble with. You know, if you've got a big aquarium in the house and there's a tendency to get into the aquarium, maybe we shouldn't have an aquarium. Um, uh, again, uh, there's a lot of disruptiveness that goes on uh, you know, during family time, we have a television that's, that's too loud. We have people that are talking too much. Uh, your loved one's behavior is a good barometer of where they're at. And, and uh, with a little bit of, of, of co coaching, you can, can begin to see the telltale signs of, of, of an emerging confusion due to the environment. So uh, si simplifying the environment, uh, a, a routinization of routine, uh, attending to your loved one, observing them, and beginning to learn what triggers, uh, you know, more wandering, more intrusiveness, uh, more impulsive behaviors, uh, and confusion. That's uh, the way to get started. Great, thank you. Um, and then there was also, uh, this is a specific question around um, your recommendations for a person who's been as assessed for an assisted living um, and would be, that would be the appropriate level of care at this time, but um, he, the person diagnosed, specifically disagrees because he thinks he's much more capable than he really is, and he's really resistant to this transition and can be combative about it. Um, so any thoughts or recommendations for that? Well, it, yeah, treatment programs, of course, have to be individualized. And, and as, we, as we walk this pathway, I think we, as caregivers and as care providers, get to know a patient pretty well. Uh, one, uh, one thing I will say is that, uh, in, in my experience, uh, very commonly, resistiveness to cares, irritability, cantankerousness, frustration, Depression and tolerance, these are things that very, very commonly indicate some degree of depression in a loved one uh, and uh, very commonly uh, respond to the treatment of, of, of depressive illness. Uh, mind you that depression, every, every, you know, depression is so common, many of us have it or have had it, uh, we all have an idea as to what it, it means to be depressed. Depression, as we get older, begins to change in terms of how it manifests itself, and depression in dementia uh, changes as well. But again, what I commonly see is resistiveness to cares, frustration, intolerance, irritability. Uh, those are signs um, uh, that may indicate uh, something that's treatable. And, uh, and when we apply therapies, and of course we don't have a, we didn't focus on non-cognitive uh, challenges here, but but uh, in a situation like this, I, I think I would look, uh, could there be depression? Might there be a reason to empirically, if, if, if you don't think that there is a depressive illness, maybe empirically try an antidepressant, that might be helpful. Great. Um, and you also mentioned the idea of you know, reducing noise in some of those environmental factors. And someone had a question about um, is there any research that you know of that's being done regarding the benefit of caregivers and FTD sufferers singing music together? I think there has been, uh, and uh, I, but unfortunately, I can't um, uh, recall it specifically. But um, but yeah, I think that mu music therapy. Uh, uh, has been shown in, in many chronic illnesses to be of great benefit, and I believe that that has been done. Uh, and I think if we did a search that we'd be able to find that. But, you know, again, uh, we, as caregivers, we want, it, it's okay to experiment a little bit and to try some things. We, we, we learn the unique uh, characteristics of our loved one in their illness, 
And it's so valuable uh, to someone like myself to have an engaged caregiver who can provide that feedback because uh, that can be very instructive or very insightful in terms of where we need to go with respect to management. So it's not a, a problem to try some things. You know, I mean, uh, the patient will do better, they'll do the same, or they'll get worse. But, and sometimes I would tell the audience that uh, we learn more from our failures than we do when we have success. So it's, it's, it's important to try some things and, and to ask questions, to think outside of the box when we're trying to, to develop a, a good treatment program for our loved ones. And uh, this is another question, because you just mentioned the idea of, um, you know, all of the agitation and things being related potentially to depression. Um, and this is a question about uh, just picking some other pieces into that mix. And so the question is, can stroke be a precursor to FTD? And can onset of FTD look like major depression if after a stroke, um, if the stroke happened many years prior? Well, uh, so yeah, kind of with respect parts. to... Yeah, yeah, forgive me, and I might have to have you repeat the second part, but, but clearly uh, in neurodegenerative illness, uh, why, why do we have such long asymptomatic periods? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, these processes uh, probably establish themselves over fairly long periods of time. They're very in indolent. They move very slowly. The brain's a very remarkable organ. It heals itself, and it, it remodels itself, and it works around these problems. You know, we talk about cognitive reserve or reserve capacity. I mean, the brain just has a remarkable ability to heal itself. When you have strokes, when you have closed head injuries, when you've had substance abuse, you know, the brain takes hits during its lifetime. And I think what we do is we eat away at that resiliency. Okay? So yes, I think if someone has, I, I, I wouldn't say that a stroke is the cause for the beginning of neurodegeneration, but I would say that a stroke occurring during the course of neurodegeneration probably, depending on where it is and how large it is, might accelerate the point in time at which we start to see the problem because that stroke has further maybe diminished one's ability to, you know, to keep that neurodegenerative process at bay. Uh, another point to be made with respect to strokes is that sometimes it's not so much the size of the stroke, but it's the location of the stroke. There are what are called strategic stroke syndromes. If you have a stroke in the right place, or maybe we should say the wrong place, you can have remarkable di disability from a very small stroke. So, but yes, I mean, I think that, that, uh, that any insult to the brain will hasten the day that a neurodegenerative illness becomes, um, becomes manifest. And forgive me, because I, uh, Bridget, I didn't hear the, the second part. Oh, sure. Uh, it was, um, can onset of FTD look like major depression, um, specifically if after a stroke happened, even though that stroke happened many years prior? Well, I don't. I, I mean, I think it can. Uh, uh, may, uh, there are forms of frontotemporal dementia that, that very commonly present with uh, psychiatric illness. And for those of you that are familiar with um, what's called the C9 mutation or the C9 open reading frame 72 mutation, uh, you may know that depression and suicidal uh, uh, thinking uh, and suicide can be the first manifestation. Of, of the illness. We, we had a patient here uh, who attempted suicide, um, who went on to be diagnosed with C9, and he came to us with depression. I mean, we thought, he came with, to us with depression and catatonia, and uh, we thought that that's all it was. So you bet uh, these illnesses, uh, front, uh, behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia is oftentimes mistaken uh, for bipolar illness bipolar depression, um, uh, OCD. Uh, so mental illness presentations of frontotemporal dementia are not at all uncommon. Now, do strokes you know, increase that chance? Well, I mean, there's some evidence to support the idea that strokes can cause someone to have depression. So I, I would believe it would be reasonable to assume that there might be some additive effect there. <clears throat> and just a quick follow-up to that. Um, if you know in the research how many cases of uh, CTE are being seen in precursors to FTD, so CTE is um, big in the news now for all of the NFL players that are and professional athletes uh, yeah. who are concussion-based. You bet. Well, that's a huge area, and the thing to note here is that uh, there is a protein uh, in CTE that's common to frontotemporal dementia, and it is tau. Uh, so you get 
you get tau deposits in chronic traumatic encephalopathy and certainly in forms of frontotemporal dementia. So there is a nexus there to some extent. Um, uh, there, there now are a consensus criteria for the neuropathological diagnosis of CTE. Uh, I'm not aware that there are consensus clinical criteria, um, but um, but there, there, they are. Um, there is some relationship there with respect to the pathogenesis, or with respect to pathogenesis, and there is some overlap with respect to the path pathogenic uh, uh, proteins uh, uh, with tau, uh, uh, most no notable. Great, thank you. And I'm just going to wrap up the environmental section um, with one last question and any advice on um, pets, so harmful or helpful in terms of the environment with uh, with FDA. I think they can be both. Well, I think they can be both. And, and we've had some uh, people do remarkably well with pets in the home and, and some uh, don't. Uh, and um, uh, one of the problems that, that we can run into with respect to the behavioral variant form is, and this may be more generalizable, but uh, patients with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia very commonly don't uh, seem to identify kind of negative or we might call them negatively balanced um, St stimuli. They, they don't see uh, their loved one's pain and they don't see the suffering of maybe, maybe an animal. And so their behavior uh, towards, uh, let's say, a, a, a household pet can, can be somewhat disturbing to family. You know, again, uh, there isn't a, a book that you can read that tells you how to do these things. We, we have to kind of again, uh, walk the pathway and see how our loved ones uh, respond. But I have had uh, many patients uh, with frontal temporal dementia who have family pets and they are seen as an asset. And then I have had some instances where, where, that, where it clearly has been a problem. So we have to individualize care. All right. Um, so I think we'll probably move on with just a summary and then we'll have hopefully some final questions um, after that and we'll wrap it up. You bet. So the key points that I wanted to, to bring forth here today is that frontotemporal dementia is not a static illness. It evolves over time. And what you will see in your loved one will, or what you will experience will evolve. The need for treatment evolves. The responsiveness of any particular treatment will change as well. And, uh, and so treatment programs need to be developed longitudinally and adjusted. It is a, it, 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 it's a long-term project and if you stay at it and apply the principles that we've outlined here, I think you can have success. Uh, remember that treatment programs maybe don't just fall into the category of psychiatry or fall into the category of neurology. We have an interlocking uh, or multi-dimensional problem here and we need to not only look at the the standard trichotomy of medicine, neurology, and psychiatry, but we need to look between these areas. How do medical problems affect the clinical phenotype or the clinical presentation of frontotemporal dementia? How do the challenges of frontotemporal dementia impact on our ability to provide adequate medical care? Uh, this, this is the way to view this. Remember, again, the visual that I have for you is, is the way to think about this, okay? So, Look, if, if your loved one with frontotemporal dementia is doing well, we might not need to parse out what we're doing in disease-specific therapies, wellness, or environmental support. But if your loved one is not doing well, the treatment isn't working, you can imagine the paradigm. What, what is it about what we're doing that could be done better? Is there, is there a, a problem in wellness management? Are we dealing with a comorbid psychiatric illness? Are we dealing with the effect, the adverse uh, effect of a medication? Um, is there a new illness that needs to be diagnosed? Or could it be the environment? Again, in behavioral variant forms of the illness, very, very commonly, the answer to some of the most challenging behaviors is environmental. It's not drugs. But we can see patients, again, who develop what we might call comorbid psychiatric illness that does respond, you know, to uh, the treatments that we might apply for unipolar or bipolar uh, depression, uh, delirium, and, and, and so on. So the paradigm here is meant to be a model for you. When things are not going well, how does your doctor or how do your do doctors solve this problem? Well, believe it or not, they, whether they realize it or not, they use this model. 
It's a model that's intended to address how we manage chronic illness. We adapt it to chronic illness of the brain. And the reality is it works. And it can make sense out of, of you know, an approach to dealing with some very difficult problems, uh, it can make sense out of that process for you. And you can help guide your doctor, you know, as well. So good. So thanks uh, for your attention. And we have a few minutes left, I think, for some questions. Yeah, um, I actually have a, a few more questions here. Um, so let's say a family would bring this uh, paradigm visual with them to maybe a, a loved one's doctor's appointment. Um, what would you suggest their kind of elevator speech be if, say, they were hoping that the doctor could help them with medications for aggressive behaviors? Um, well, again, the, where, where I would put that would be under the wellness uh, and and you know management of behaviors and and the and that's a that's a that's a, a talk in and of itself. You know, what what is the process of of managing difficult behaviors uh, with respect to the use of medicines and and so on, um, it's not uh, you know um, th this is uh, you know maybe a, a difficult question to to answer in a short period of time. But but here's what what I would say with respect to the management of di difficult behaviors. There is the science of medicine. We know a lot about the brain. We know a lot about how the brain works. But there's a lot that we don't understand about the neuropsychiatric manifestations of, of these il illnesses. And very commonly, the treatments are applied somewhat empirically, meaning it's kind of trial and error. And I like to tell people that the therapeutic vision in managing neuropsychiatric illness in, let's say, frontal temporal dementia is not 2020. I mean, we it, it's not like treating strep throat. But it's not blind. It's not like we don't know a lot about the brain. But what it requires us to do is to generate reasonable hypotheses as to what may be the problem. Now, again, there might be a behavioral problem related to an environmental influence, uh, and that needs to be addressed. But if we believe that we're in the area, let's say, of neuropsychiatric illness, that opens up a whole other uh, aspect of care, and uh, and and really, uh, you know, trials of of therapy intended to eliminate the dangerous or dysfunctional behaviors while preserving functionality and cognitive performance. Uh, a, a kind of a tough one to respond to in a short period of time, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, and another one, if, um, so current research suggests that FTD's progression is anywhere from 2 to 20 years. Can you speak to any thoughts on how this paradigm can help caregivers balance and sustain the day-to-day -day care given uh, with the uncertainty of that life expectancy? So you were kind of talking about it being a longitudinal thing. Um, and just without knowing what you know that means, um, yeah. any type of balance on that. Well, I think that I think that we I think the trajectory of illness becomes evident over time, and the uh, the uh, the uh, questioner here is right that that we see patients maybe with FDD ALS that can can succumb to the illness over a relatively short period of time, maybe you know two to three years. And then we see people that can live up to 20 years. Um, uh, in, the, in the case of the more kind of protracted illness, I do think that we see a much longer period of time where, where active interventions maybe have less effect. And again, maybe the environmental approach uh, becomes more, more important. Um, uh, I very commonly get asked from families, you know, how long might someone uh, survive with an illness like like this? Very, very hard to know. You know, when they when they look at the when they prognosticate, they uh, people that look at the illness, they're really looking at the illness in some isolation. They're not considering medical problems. You know, uh, I always tell families, you know, God doesn't it doesn't promise anybody tomorrow and and we just don't know these things one pneumonia you know a hip fra fracture could change that that whole you know timeline but but um, but certainly in the more protracted you know we get the six to eight years up to 20 years of illness this paradigm works very very well in 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 the in the uh, context of a more rapidly advancing illness very commonly we're we're battling the the rapidly changing uh, state of the patient. Uh, I think it, you know. I think these principles can still work, but maybe a little more challenging. 
Okay. Uh, so last question, because I think it's a quick one. Um, does a person with FTD know they have it, and should we be discussing any issues with them? Great question. Um, I think that uh, there are many patients with frontal temporal dementia at certain stages of the illness that know that they have the illness. But self-awareness is very commonly a casualty. And, and again, in my experience, it's not an all or none phenomenon. It's not as if either you have self-awareness or you don't have it. Self-awareness can kind of ebb and flow. Sometimes it seems to be there, sometimes it's gone. And as we advance in the illness, um, I think you see uh, self-awareness self maybe uh, being a little, you know, being more compromised. Uh, uh, in terms of having conversations, um, I think frontotemporal dementia presents remarkable challenge. I might start by talking about uh, having conversations with Alzheimer patients. Alzheimer patients uh, have the social uh, functions of the brain fairly well preserved, and they respond very well to emotional cues and social cues and vocal inflection. That may not be the case in out or in frontotemporal dementia. I always tell my my caregivers in in Alzheimer's disease is maybe not what you say is how you say it. That can be more challenging uh, in frontotemporal, particularly in the behavioral variant form. Many, uh, many in the audience know that it's very hard sometimes in behavioral variant uh, FTD to read emotionally their loved one. You know, they have maybe this kind of uh, deadpan face. You, you can't. You know, are they angry? Are they? happy? Are they frustrated? It's very, very hard to know. And I think it's legitimate maybe sometimes to ask, are they feeling these things? I think that I tell people in, in, my, in my work, I presume when I have a conversation with, with any of my patients that they can understand what I'm saying. And I uh, work on vocal inflection uh, uh, and, and, and nonverbal cues uh, in case my patients can read them. Uh, you know, again, honesty, I think, is the best policy is in, in terms of how we approach our, our loved ones who have an illness like this. But we have to be mindful uh, that sometimes we can talk too much. Uh, and we can agitate a patient, uh, so we have to to be you know observant. Uh, but my uh, my general advice is uh, presume that they can, that they can un understand you at some level. I, I I think if you take that posture, there will be times, particularly in the beginning of the illness, where that you will be able to connect with them, and so you'll be ready. If if they are unable to connect, uh, then um, then that's the way it is, but uh, but I I wouldn't second guess them. I would always uh, approach uh, a communication as if they can understand at least at some level. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Holman. We're going to switch to the last slide. Um, so thank you so much for uh, for joining us, Dr. Holman, for all of you um, who joined us today on the webinar. We hope that you found this presentation helpful, and we look forward to sharing it with you. Um, as well as uh, more FTD educational webinars in the future. So as a reminder, this was recorded for those um, who maybe want to take a look back. And um, please, please let us know if you have any questions um, about today's presentation, or if maybe the questions that you asked weren't specifically answered. Um, we'd be more than happy to you know, try to get those answered if you reach out to our helpline. Um, so this ends our presentation today. And again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And until next time, take good care. Thank you. Bye-bye.